Dear friends and followers, welcome back to my channel and lovely greetings from the Brooklyn Museum of the birthplace of British motorsport and aviation history. Today's video is an episode of one of three because a five minute video could never cover the amazing facts about today's airplane. She has been one of my childhood dreams and is, she is by far one of the most beautiful passenger jets that has ever existed. The Boeing 747 might be the queen of the skies, but the plane we'll be talking about today is as beautiful as Princess Diana. May I present you the Concorde. That's the living good evening, Steve, the Concorde uh, 1, on stand 421, uh, requesting other articles. Good evening, Steve, 1, Compton 5, Julia's departure, Squawk 7651, Standard Track Sierra Mike, Information Golf, QNH 1021, Mother Buzz. We'll be talking about some amazing facts you might not have known about this plane. We'll go through a typical flight profile flying from London Heathrow to New York, John F. Kennedy. And we'll chat with a former Concorde captain, John Hutchinson, about his life as a captain for British Airways and much more. So sit back and enjoy the tour with me around Concorde. Uh, 1383, runway 27, here at takeoff. The origins of this plane go way back into the 1950s as British engineers came up with the idea of commercial supersonic transport. Reliable supersonic jets at the time were the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter or the Little Fairy Delta II, which both had a major impact on the wing design for future Concorde prototypes. As French engineers from the airplane manufacturer Aerospatiale were also planning on developing a supersonic jet for commercial use, British Aircraft Corporation, BAC, decided on working together on this mighty project rather than against. So both countries would work in very close relation to one another and signed a treaty in 1962 to start working on the first two prototypes. And there is a reason why both countries decided on naming the plane Concorde, as Concorde means agreement, harmony or union. In 1965, Aerospatiale started building Concorde 001 and simultaneously 002 was built in Filton, Bristol. After four years of hard work, Concorde 001 performed its maiden flight from Toulouse in front of thousands of spectators. And both prototypes were then presented at the Paris Air Show in 1969. After numerous world tours to present the aircraft to airlines, many of them signed up for order and 74 Concords were planned. But the glory shouldn't last for long, unfortunately, after a tragic event in 1973 at the Paris Air Show in Le Bourget, as a tuple of 144, Concorde's imminent rival, crashed during its presentation flight. And many airlines immediately withdraw their orders, resulting in only 20 aircraft ever built. And the plane you see right here is Concorde 003, as she is one of six prototypes. She only has about 1,300 hours on her watch, as she never entered commercial service. But she was the first plane ever to carry 100 passengers at twice the speed of sound. She also flew to certify further performance enhancements after the other 14 production aircraft were in commercial service. The other 14 Concords which went into service were flown by British Airways and Air France, as both companies were more or less stuck with them, as both governments decided on what should happen with the rest of the program. And British Airways was a nationalized airline at the time when their seven Concords entered the fleet, but British Airways didn't really want the Concorde, but as it was a nationalized and Concorde's program was financed by the government, and British Airways being the only British airline at the time, they were forced to integrate the Concorde in their fleet. So British Airways paid a symbolic transactional fee of one pound per plane, and it was actually the taxpayers who owned and paid for the Concorde build. And there is a rumor that Concorde wasn't profitable at all. And that is not entirely true because British Airways didn't have to pay 55 million pounds worth each airplane. So no capital costs. And for that reason, she was profitable from day one. 
And at Concorde's peak, she made 20% of all profits in one year for British Airways, and they only had seven of them. So imagine how high the ticket prices must have been. But all history aside, let's perform an outside check and let's talk about some key elements what make Concorde so different from a normal jetliner. So let's get right to it. Here at the front of Concorde, we have her iconic nose and it's able to move the nose into four different positions. And as you can see here, that's the fully up position with the visor or heat shield protecting the main cockpit windshield and making it very streamlined for high speed flight. The next position is visor down, which then gets retracted and slides into the nose cone. You rarely saw her in that position, only if the pilots decided after landing that the windshield needed cleaning. Five degrees down, including the visor for taxiing, takeoff and initial climb and approach or visual approaches. And as you were stabilized on your approach and extended the landing gear, you then lowered the nose into its fully down position of 12.5 degrees for landing which then completely removed the nose from the pilot's view onto the runway. So some pilots actually complained as the nose and visor were down, the cockpit became terribly loud due to the disturbed airflow around the nose hitting the windshield. But once it was fully up and the heat shield making it very streamlined, it was like someone unplugged a noisy stereo. And the tilting of the noise was primarily to just to ensure the clear view onto the runway for the pilots. It didn't really have any aerodynamic significance besides the noise. But the pilots had to train and land the plane with the nose fully up in the simulator in case the tilting system would have failed. But were then advised to perform an automatic landing. Automatic landing on a Concorde. I'll come back to that later. The landing gear of Concorde is relatively tall compared to other airplanes, but obviously for a reason. As she comes in for landing, her pitch attitude is up to 11 degrees due to the lift characteristics of the delta wing. In that flight phase, a lower pitch attitude would create less lift over the wing resulting in a higher landing speed. And to prevent the engine's tail from scraping the runway upon touchdown, Concorde was fitted with a tail strike bumper at the far rear of the tail and the high landing gear. Also, the landing gear was fitted with carbon disc brakes, which performed very efficiently and to prevent the brakes from overheating. After landing, she was one of the first airplanes to have brake fans to dissipate the generated heat within the wheel rim. And besides the tall landing gear, the flight deck is roughly 35 feet ahead of the nose wheel. So taxiing and lining up on the runways was pretty challenging for the pilots. For example, when you were lining up on the runway, the pilots had to move forward until the flight deck was nearly above the curb of the runway and then performed a 90 degree turn to line up on the runway to end on the runway center line. Here in the background, you can see the intakes of the four very powerful Rolls-Royce Olympus 593 turbojet engines. Each engine had its own intake and the engine nacelle were paired with a splitter plate between them to minimize adverse behavior of one power plant influencing the other. The intake doors were controlled hydraulically and the opening was monitored by a computer which adapted the opening of the intake depending on the airplane's speed. For example, at Mach 2, the air was reduced from 1,350 miles per hour to 550 miles per hour so that the airspeed entered the turbine at smooth subsonic speeds, reducing the risk of an engine surge. But these four engines created an incredible noise upon takeoff, generating 122,000 pounds of thrust. And by adding the reheaters, or better known as the afterburners, the pilots could increase by the output by another 30,000 pounds by just the push of a button, making 152,000 pounds of thrust accessible upon takeoff. So all four engines were fitted with a reheater system where fuel was shot into the exhaust end of the engines, which gave the engines an extra boost of 20% more power. The afterburners were only used for two flight phases at takeoff, and that only for a minute and a half, because you would then have reached the noise abatement altitude, 
you would then cancel the reheaters and put the thrust levers to a predetermined climb power setting. And the other flight phase where you would use the reheaters I'll explain in the next video. The rudders at the rear of the wing were either ailerons if you perform a roll or an elevator if you would pull or push on the yoke or a combination of both. So they were called elevons. So that was it for today. Make sure to tune in next week as I'll be giving you an exclusive tour around the Concorde cockpit and we'll go through a classic flight profile from a flight from London to JFK and make sure to perform a touch and go at my Instagram account as I'll be uploading many pictures of my experience with this beautiful plane and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. See you next week. All the best, your Captain Joe.